handout earlier today, and it has a lot of statistics and so on, but for obvious reasons, I didn't want to go through each one of the statistics. If for no other reason, some of you would have taken out your machete and cut, and cut me up in small pieces, you know, sort of thing. But um, uh, I wanted to use those handouts, uh, particularly now on the U.S. side of the border, if you will, uh, to what it means for farm labor uh, and so on. And one of the first things, I'm not sure to what extent Bill was able to get into this, and that is the holes, in a sense, the, the, the gaps in what used to be a farm labor cycle, whether you were an interstate, uh, interstate migrant labor that has started in Texas, went through California, up through Washington, and so on, then came back down to Texas. And there was a time where there's a labor cycle that started with cotton picking, uh, in East Texas, went into the Gila River Valley of Arizona, then into Imperial Coachella Valley, then jumping up to either the San Joaquin Valley or up through Oxnard and so on, which at one time, believe it or not, was an agricultural area. Now the subdivisions are kind of taking over all of the strawberry fields and so on. Then up through Salinas, back into the upper Sacramento Valley. Those of you who know Yuba City, Chico, and this sort of thing, there's a lot of fruit trees, etc. And then into Oregon, into Washington, and then by that time, it, if it was still available, you could e easily go into Idaho and pick up potatoes and this sort of thing, then back down to Texas, winter there, and then start up the whole cycle again. So that interstate migrant cycle began to have a lot of gaps as more and more mechanization impacted on that labor cycle. So that's one aspect of it. And it impacted on California because when a Texas migrant farm workers were, in a sense, thrown out of that long period of time of picking cotton. Then they began to look for alternatives to kind of fill that gap, if you will. And one of the places they went to, in fact, in large numbers, was in fact to California. So the competition for agricultural labor intensified in the late 50s and early 1960s. That's when I became uh, uh, a, an adult or a young adult farm worker and so on. And I remember the competition when the Texans showed up. Showed up. It wasn't just that they were competing for jobs in the fields and so forth and so on, but they were competing in other ways for housing, not to mention the competition that went on in the, uh, in the dance halls in the San Joaquin Valley during the harvest season and so on where the Texas guys with their cowboy hats and cowboy boots were in a sense competing with us Mexican-American resident farm workers for the charms of Deborah. Okay, so, <laughs> and uh, it, that just added, if you will, to the to the kind of tensions that 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 occurred. And I suspect, as as Phil pointed out, in that respect, the structural conditions surrounding the UFW right, uh, probably would have would have meant that. Chavez and his effort would have had even much lesser success and within a shorter time period. But because of the civil rights movement and because Chavez was anointed, canonized as a kind of secular farm labor saint in that respect, it gave him a lot more political capital and it made the legs of the movement easier to maneuver. Um, in the East Coast, when I was there in the East Coast as a graduate student, I was part of the boycott committee of the greater Boston area, and so on. And it was amazing the number of people in snow, uh, and so on, marching around uh, A&P stores, and so on, as, as they were called, um, uh, to stop selling uh, non-lettuce, uh, non-union lettuce, non-union grapes, and so forth, and so on. Well, that moment in history dissipated. So all those structural conditions that Phil discussed, as, as I understand it, then came back in, in a, with a vengeance, if you will, uh, to bite the UFW, literally, if you pardon the expression, in the neck, uh, at the juggle. Uh, I know some of you are <laughs> Okay, I can tell it's the end of the day. All right. Um, those structural conditions then were, um, uh, were making it difficult for the UFW, and those difficulties were exacerbated, as Frank discussed, with the shortcomings of the inner workings of the UFW, and particularly the role of Cesar Chavez, and he discussed those, so I'm not going to repeat them. All right? But there was another structural condition 
that I think it's important to consider, not only the continuing arrival of unauthorized immigrants, which I assume uh, Phil discussed and so on, but other structural conditions were changing that impacted that labor cycle. And in the case of California in particular, when you think about the fact that 80%, 90%, 70% of various kinds of crops for the entire US market come from one place, the United States. And I use one of the more dramatic examples, and that was strawberries. If you got a chance to go through the handout and so on, wine grapes, 90% of wine production in the US comes from California. Uh, and, and as an example of what those changes meant for farm labor. So we already talked about cotton, so that was that. Another big impact was lettuce. With the lettuce boycott, there was an accelerated move to reduce, to the extent possible, the use of labor to pick up lettuce. Right? Now, the lettuce story comes back in another way, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, another um, uh, major crop that became highly mechanized was tomatoes. Right? And if you think about all the ketchup that people use, not us, we would never eat those big fried stuff and so on. But you know people who do, all right? All the ketchup that's used on French fries and so on, now you're beginning to see the connection with fast food and things of that nature, right? So tomatoes became increasingly mechanized. So when I started picking tomatoes, it was all done by hand. And the first time we saw these butterflies with these extended arms and this sort of thing, it changed the amount of farm labor that was necessary. So that was another crop that put a big hole in terms of the amount of farm labor that was needed at various points uh, in, in, in the year. When pistachios became important, for whatever reason, we became enamored at a particular moment in time with pistachios, pistachios, pardon me, and so on. And again, that accelerated the desire when later we found out walnuts are good for us and nuts in general are good for us, within moderation, but they're good for us and so on, that expanded the acreage. But in the old days, you picked nuts by hand. And that had to be mechanized, and I gave the example of almond trees and so forth and so on. Another uh, crop that um, was dented, uh, if you will, uh, by mechanization uh, and, and so on, was the beginnings of picking grapes, not with people, but with machines. And the first major introduction of machines was, in fact, into wine grapes. And it started in the San Joaquin Valley because one of those growers that was badly hurt by the boycott, because when you were for the boycott, all grapes were bad. It didn't matter, right? Because you didn't go through it by these union grapes and so on. And that was my good friends, the Gallo Corporation, which at that time totally dominated what us college students knew everything about. And that was cheap, sweet wine. Right? None of you remember this, you're too young. But there was such a thing called Thunderbird, Valley High, all right, and so on, right? So the Gallo Corporation dominated the production of that kind of grapes. And when they were uh, tainted, let us say, um, or brushed with a negative uh, paint in terms of grapes and this sort of thing, then the Gallo Corporation put a great deal of effort on beginning to find out what they could do to reduce the dependence on farm labor to pick all those grapes that ended up in cheap wine and so on with 7-Up, Sangria, uh, and so on. My first really bad headache with, uh, uh, with the wine concoction and so on was because of that. I think it was called Spagnata, this horrible stuff. Anyway, but uh, it was a cheap way to get drunk. Uh, uh, and I only did that once. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. But anyway, um, the mechanization of grapes, again, put a hole. Uh, and then we think about other grapes, raisin grapes. Now, I don't know how many of you like raisin bran and those sort of raisin cookies and blah, 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 uh, sort of thing. But in the old days, they actually use wooden trays to put the grapes on, so they would dry, and then you had to flip that wooden tray to the other side in order to dry the grapes that were not facing the sun the first time they were put on the wooden trays. When they switched to paper, it was like heaven sent. It's kind of like, remember when, when 
You, well, again, most of you are too young for it. But there was a time when you made a mistake and with a typewriter. <laughs> you had to use that white out stuff. And remember when IBM came out with that white blue ribbon where all you had to do was backspace? It was Nirvana, right? Sort of thing. For those of us who grew up with having buckets, right? Of white, white out and this sort of thing as a young student at high school, college, uh, and the like. So uh, in that respect, uh, when those kinds of technological changes began to occur, uh, including raisin paper and this sort of thing, then for us who turned those wooden things, it was, they were bulky, they were heavy, you get uh, estillas, help me. Splinters. Splinters, right, in your hand and so on. Uh, when they came up with paper, it was great. You could go much faster. Now, they have these machines that go through and flip the paper. So all that effort, I don't know how many of you have ever seen people turn trays right, and this sort of thing. You do that for 10 hours a day, that hurts your back. Right? And that's when the Oaxaqueños came to hit the raisin fields of the San Joaquin Valley. All right? Because they never stopped. Resident farm workers, when it came to turning trays, tended to stop when it got really hot and this sort of thing, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they would stop. 100 degrees, that was it. Even my mother, who was an incredible farm worker, and so on, would say, okay, enough, we'll take a break, we'll go home, we'll come back at sunset. And that's what we did. And we would get there in the morning, and the Oaxaqueños, we call them, but later we found out they were Vistecos. Most of them were about this tall. All right? And they would be there before us. And my mother was a type that would get there so early in the morning, it was so dark, that she would put the headlights on the car down the road so we could get started. You know, she didn't want us to rest anymore. We would get there, and the Oaxaqueños were already there, and we wondered, okay, these guys vampires or what? They can see the dark, you know, sort of thing. And they would work, and it would be a hundred degrees, and that was it. We would go home for a while and come back, and they were still going. We could hear that that rustling of paper, cha 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 cha, as it. Then we'd get there at sunset, and they were still there. Oh my God. And we would leave at dusk, because it was getting dark, not to mention all the grumbling, Mom, okay, enough already, we've done 10,000 trays among all of us in the family, uh, and this sort of thing, and they would still be there. Right? So when we talk about unauthorized immigration coming in, we have to think of its impact in terms of the labor cycle, because you're essentially moving people out either implicitly or explicitly. Um, so that's just a few examples. So when people began to change their diets, that added to the complications in the farm labor cycle. Some of you may recall from your grandparents or maybe your parents, there was a lot of people who used to can things, all right? With mason jars, with the little gold things, and your mother sent you to the store to get all that stuff, and the paraffin wax, and so on. Something that all of you do, I'm sure, right? But in the old days, they did it even more so, all right? So, canned peaches, and the best variety are clean peaches, if you know anything about peaches, and so on. And the same thing with apricots, and so forth, and so on. Well, there was a time where you pick peaches based on the canning industry. And the canning industry, their level of criteria for quality of the fruit, quality of the vegetable, is lower than for those products that are going to the fresh produce market, those big, beautiful peaches, and so on, that look great when they're out there at Safeway, or Vons, or now Whole Foods, or Bowl, whatever it may be. Right? Uh, in that respect, when we began to insist on fresh vegetables more and more, as opposed to canned vegetables. There was a time where people ate asparagus, to a large extent, from cans. Right? There was a time where most people ate strawberries frozen, and so on. Right? So the statistics that I have in there, simple things like refrigerators, most of us take it for granted, crispers, there, and as I mentioned uh, in, in, the, um, in the statistics, we jumped from using ice for refrigeration within half a generation. That is, if you grew up as a kid in, in a particular period of time, 
one of your jobs was to go to the ice plant when your little wagon or whatever it was and get a 20 pound, 25 pound block of ice, take it home, and in the Fresno you had to go early in the morning because if you went in the middle of the day, by the time you got home, you lost half of it because it melted, you know, sort of thing. So you had to go early in the morning or late at night, which was another thing that some people did. Just go late at night, it comes down the chute, you throw it in the back of the car, and you run home, and so on. If you look at the statistics, within less than a generation, most households in the United States had some kind of refrigeration. And then we put those things in the top called freezers. Right now, from that generation, they went this way, not the double-sided ones that now have become ubiquitous uh, in that regard. Um, in that respect, then, as we became more suburbanized, as we became more urbanized, as we had more and more people educated, and more, very importantly, as more and more women became second income earners, right? that allowed us to buy fresh fruit and fresh vegetables more often. And as we had children, especially the baby boomers, and we started reading books, How to Raise Your Child. I won't talk about Benjamin Spock. All right? But we also read books and articles in the newspapers, in the magazines, about what we should feed our children. Fresh vegetables and this sort of thing. Not this canned stuff, etc. And then we had, uh, uh, I call it an Osterizer, because that was the first brand that I recall. Right? So instead of buying baby food that was made for you, processed food, now a very awful thing right, to say. Uh, then you started using fresh stuff and did your own things, if you could afford it, if you had the time. Which brings me to another part of the labor cycle and the role of women working. The more women worked, the more time was spent outside the home in food preparation. Outside the home, by going to a grocery store and buying something that you could prepare at home. Look at the figures on microwaves. No one had microwaves. And then, uh, what, 1% of the population had microwaves. Then we jumped up to 25%. And in four years, it went to 90%. All right, certainly. Then. Think of all the kids who got home from school, and instead of having a fresh peach or fresh apricots and so on, they pop something in the oven. <coughs> or in the morning, instead of having fresh fruit and so on, they popped in the Pop-Tarts, or whatever it may be. And because of peer pressure and so on, putting incredible pressure on parents, I want Pop-Tarts, I want Pop-Tarts, <laughs> or whatever it is, right? Or at the end of the day, I want macaroni and cheese, or whatever it may be. And many parents just gave up. Okay, okay, all right. I'm not gonna force you to eat peaches from a tree, okay, et cetera. All of these things contributed then, in one way or another, to changes in the farm labor cycle. Take, for example, wine grapes. As all of you know, who are wine connoisseurs, now most wine grapes, especially premium wine grapes, are picked late in the afternoon when the sun is most intense. True or false? Who said false? That was a good guess, or that's based on knowledge? It makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Want right? the sugars to because you want the sugars to be stable. The more heat, more sugar. More sugar, it changes the taste of the wine. So that now, most wine grapes, especially premium wine grapes, are picked early in the morning. They start at 4 a.m., 4.30. In some cases, they start at midnight. And with lights from the tractors and so on, they're picking the grapes. Around 10, 11, they stop because the sugar content is not... You don't want it to go too hot. And you stop and you go again. But what do you do in the afternoon? Well, I'll just go pick peaches in the afternoon. It doesn't work that way. So you can work for six hours, seven hours in the morning, and then that's it. Because there's really no alternative to go work in the afternoon unless you've got a job at in and out or something like that. But for many farm workers, the idea of working from sunrise to sunset or most of the day has lessened, has been reduced. The same thing happens at certain, with certain products uh, that are not as perishable, let us say, as grapes. But if we stop and think about strawberries, if we stop and think about any fruit that has sugar content, when is the best time to pick it? 
And that's another aspect of the story, which, again, if I had the time, we could go through and do all of it. Um, the changes in the American diet. And you've done the reading, or some of you have done the reading. I won't go through all of the examples and so on. But my favorite is lettuce. Because most people who are part of this concern about diets and so on, and how healthy we eat, and this sort of thing, if you go to now grocery stores, you're going to see this long bin of plastic boxes with all different varieties of mixing of greens. Right? You have the spring mix. You have the the baby spinach, you have the mix of this baby spinach with the greens, you have the mix, the Italian mix, and so on, right? You, you have a smorgasbord of things. But those things have to remain fresh. So the picking of greens, or the cutting, if you will, of greens and so on, is such that, again, if you go to Salinas, much of the picking of those greens is early in the morning because they got to get it into the trucks, get it to a refrigeration, a refrigeration unit, that can be put then in packaging and then put into the grocery stores. Because it doesn't last long. And those of us who have the bad experience of it looks fine on top, you take it home, you dump it into a big salad bowl, and the bottom part has already begun to get kind of yucky and, and, and wrinkly uh, and this sort of thing. Then you get angry. Why did they put it out there? And so forth and so on. Well, for farm workers, that's an important part of the story. And then you add to that when it's too cold, when it's too hot, when um, the fields are too, uh, are too wet because of a sudden rainstorm, and this sort of thing, everything's got to stop. And the alternatives are this big. You just have to, quote unquote, sit it out. Or when prices go down for whatever reason, a farmer will literally wait a day, sometimes longer, to actually go out and cut the radicchio or cut the, the asparagus as the case happens to be. Right. Not to mention, again, the reduction in labor from having those new conveyor belts and so on, where people just throw it up into the conveyor belt, and you have three or four people that are taking off the outside of the lettuce and so on and packaging it. And it's all done there, including the packaging. The cardboard boxes are there, they're folded up and so on, and just throw them on the truck. Think about all the workers that are left out of the loop now that we've done that in terms of mechanization and the like. Right? But the important thing is fresh lettuce. And one of the items I put in your handout is 560% increase right, in fresh cut items. Those are those little plastic boxes with the spring mix and so on that we are able to get now. In the old days, you had basically iceberg lettuce. Right? That was it. For hamburgers, for lettuce, for anything like that, it was icebergs. Then we started seeing other varieties like romaine. And I remember romaine because that was huge. Right? Because in restaurants, when you got Caesar salad, it was usually done with romaine. So when you're able to bring it home, whoa, now we can have Caesar salad and so forth and so on. Right? And now, most of us don't even think about using romaine, right? maybe as a blend, right? But many of us now have to have the ratifu and the arugula and all that sort of stuff and fresh cut cheese, not that craft stuff, parmesan, etc. right? That I grew up with and so on. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Um, now, it's in that regard, as Chavez developed the United Farm Workers, to a large extent, these considerations were minimized and what it would mean for organizing workers. Because workers then would have a high turnover rate, not only because of queuing, what we talked about earlier, that is moving into the non-agricultural sector, but also because of economic necessity. If you're only working six hours a day, and you're here to work, and work as much and as long, and make as much as long as you can, you feel cheated, in a manner of speaking. I remember, um, the picking up potatoes, and the machines would break down. And they would have to rush out a mechanic and this sort of thing. And on the one hand, whew, we get a break. But when the break lasted an hour, then two hours, then three hours, because they couldn't find the part for that contraption that brought the dirt up and with it the potatoes, and we had to go out there and pick them up, then you had a waste of three hours. Sometimes they would just tell us, go home. 
And I remember my, my mom being angry and my dad being angry because that six hours, four hours that we expected to work were now lost, sort of thing. Right? Um, and the opposite would sometimes happen. The price of tomato would go up, or for whatever reason, the, the harvest in some other part of the country, in the so-called Magic Valley of Southern Texas or in Florida, then tomato prices and the farmers would flood the fields with water, creating this muddy muck. Okay? And then they would ask us to go out there and pick tomatoes. And I don't know how many of you have walked in mud with your shoes, and sometimes your shoe stays. All right? Does that slow you down in terms of picking tomatoes? You betcha. All right? So rather than maybe doing 160 buckets, you were down to 80 buckets. Same amount of time, but because of the mud and this sort of thing, you get the picture. So those are the everyday experiences and others that I could mention that influence the whole concept of doing farm labor. Because very quickly, as I suspect uh, uh, Phil mentioned, as more and more unauthorized immigrants came in, it compressed, if you will, all of those issues that I just mentioned. It compressed the problematic of being a farm worker. And for those of us who were resident farm workers at the time, it put even more pressure to get out, to get out. And in my parents' case, they started as temporary workers in a cannery, just a couple of weeks during the very peak of the canning season, uh, canning olives and this sort of thing. And then it became seasonal, where they worked maybe a month, two months at the cannery. Then it became, with seniority, four months, six months, and eventually they became Full time, that is, from the start of the season to the end of the season, they had a job in the cannery. And my parents, in that respect, for all intents and purposes, stopped doing farm work except when it came to turning raisins. Because all of us could turn raisins and make a lot of money. So my parents always took their vacation in late August, early September to take advantage of doing that. And I remember going through the rows and turning raisins and so on. And by this time I was in college, and I remember I was about to go to graduate school, um, and I was out there, I felt bad staying home. So I went out there with my parents. I remember people go, wait a minute, Alex, I thought you were going to go to Harvard. Yeah, well I am, but after raisin season is over. <laughs> That's a true story. That's a true story. So uh, in, in that sense, all of these pressures were underestimated by those of us who supported the union, underestimated, it seems to me, by the leadership of the UFW, and underestimated by the public. Because the public, to a large extent, supported the union. If it wasn't for the public support, non-Latinos, because non-Latinos, if they stopped eating grapes tomorrow, no one would notice. Right? No one would really notice. Because most fresh grapes are consumed by non-Latinos. Uh, in that respect, then, uh, and certainly at that time, because keep in mind the Latino population was much, much smaller in the late, uh, the mid, late, and early uh, 70s, 60s, and so on. Uh, in that respect, that period of time then, for those of us who were involved in, in the farm labor movement, we underestimated the changes that were taking place. We never connected the dot between the percentage of women with children under the age of six and you have it in your statistics there, right? And right after the war, only 6% of women with children under the age of six worked outside their home. Now it's about half. Right? And we didn't connect the dots. We didn't connect the dots in terms of television and what that meant. Because television told us how to live. And I included in your handout the article from, New York, the, New York, from the New York Times in the celebration of Sunset Magazine. A lot of people were living like one expected in the Sunset Magazine. And we didn't connect the dot, in a sense, between being farm workers and the changes that were taking place in the consumption of food, fruits, vegetables, and the like. We didn't take into account the volatility in food consumption. We didn't understand the, the significance of adolescence and what that meant for food consumption. Didn't get it. That is, the number of teenagers who did not eat at home. We call it grazing now. But in those days, you went to high school. If you had a car, you cruised. If you didn't have a car, you tried to find someone who did, and you would cruise. And you do the loops, 
And then eventually you stopped at a hamburger joint or a hot dog joint and so on. You had a milkshake and so on. Made eyes at the car next door where Michelle and Deborah were sitting or Jean and this sort of thing and made inane conversation in the hopes that they would be impressed uh, and this sort of thing, right? I know I'm talking to another generation. But that was the day. And when you got home, you weren't necessarily hungry for a big meal and so on. And mom was tired. She had just worked most of the day. Dad, of course, was tired. And mom decided, today we're going to eat something else. And uh, in one of your articles, they talk about the number of food items that are available to us in grocery stores. If you stop and think about it, think about all the different kinds of coffee you can get now all the different kinds of cereals. And then, my favorite is apples. Because I grew up, red apples. That's it. Now, we have all these apples. Some of them you can't pronounce anymore, right? <laughs> depending on where they're coming from, and this sort of thing. And if you think about all those apples, now they're merging things, right? Apples with certain kinds of plums. So you have these big, huge plums now, and this sort of thing. And we could go on and give other examples. All of that impinges on farm labor because these specialty crops, as they're, as they're called, how long do they last? This long. Immediately, they have to be picked when they come to market. It's not like in the old days where almost all the apple trees were the same variety and they were all picked more or less at the same time. But now you have trees where the longevity of the labor required is going to be smaller. So you have the fragmentation of farm labor in that regard. And that, again, we underestimated at that time and the long-term, if not short-term, implications of those kinds of changes. Uh, the last thing, uh, and this has a lot to do uh, with wine grapes. Uh, the skill that is necessary to pick, quote-unquote, wine grapes isn't at that moment where you actually cut the grapes. The, the specialization now that's required in, in the wine grape industry, if you've never had the opportunity, think about just simple things like pruning. Because you have to prune wine grapes a particular way. You just can't go there and just start cutting, all right, sort of thing. If for no other reason, Mr. Gallo or Mr. Mondavi, whoever the person was or is, and this sort of thing will come and conk you on the head, sort of thing. There's a skill involved. The skill of going through and choosing which grape bunches you're going to thin out, as it's called, so you get bigger berries and you get more concentrated fruit, meaning more concentrated wine flavors and so forth and so on. That's a skill. Then you go through and you decide which of the suckers you're going to cut because you want the grapes to have enough shade, but not too much, where they don't get air and sun in order to get those premium wines and so on. That takes skill, and so on. And then sometimes, because of a heat wave and this sort of thing, you're going to get those workers in there really quick. And it's not like farm workers are like uh, what uh, relief pitchers in baseball, where they're sitting on a bench just waiting for someone to blow a whistle, in a manner of speaking. And in that sense, again, for people who depend on farm labor, all of these vicissitudes, if you will, in the farm labor cycle and so on, add to the pressure to get out. I don't think Cesar Chavez and those of us involved and so on, we never saw farm labor as a lifelong career, but we didn't see it as a, a stage in one's work life where there would be these gaps. It would be like teaching school. And because of tax cuts and this sort of thing, you only work three hours in the morning. And then we're going to take furlough days and then we're going to teach again. That sound familiar? That sound familiar? Giving up health benefits? Giving up days? Right? We have this, uh, what? Fear monitoring? Okay, the teaching days are going to be reduced down to 160 days, 120 days. And if that's paid to your income, what is that going to do? Is that going to put pressure on a lot of people not to go into teaching? Yeah. And in that sense, in the same way that other occupations have been hit with changes, structural and otherwise, that impinge upon their work life, to some extent there are some parallels with what's happening, or what did happen, and it continues to happen with farm labor. Needless to say, a lot of the immigrant workers that come in, they see farm labor 
as temporary as possible. They stay in it only to the extent that they don't have alternatives. And the first chance they get, nine times out of ten, is they're going to get out. And one of the consequences of that is how many farmers have turned to mechanization because the, far, the immigrants arrive with no knowledge at all of the kinds of skills that are necessary to do the work. Uh, my compadre, um, uh, the, the man and, and wife who um, baptized my daughter, they have a small ranch outside of Fresno. It's only 33 acres. Right? He does a lot of the work himself and so on. But uh, once in a while he calls me, half jokingly, why don't you come and help me pick some of the grapes, all right, and I'll provide you with all of the wine or whatever that you might need. I usually say Diet Coke's enough, but that, if you believe that, you believe the sun is always blue. But seriously, I remember uh, that morning where two guys showed up recently arrived, I mean raw, they just arrived to the Fresno bus station and they were desperate to find work. They show up in slacks like mine, wool slacks, pointed shoes, all right, a kind of dress shirt, if you will, no hat, and they wanted to know if they could pick grapes. Totally raw, had no idea what they were doing, all right. Uh, and my compadre said, well, uh, do you have a pen? Because to pick grapes you need a pen. They said, no. So he went into his garage, found one, and so on. Do you have a knife? And he took out a pocket knife. No, 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 you don't use a pocket knife to pick grapes. They have these kind of hook knives and this sort of thing. The poor guys worked half a day. They had had it. They had had it in two ways. First, it was too hot. But more importantly, their productivity was this big. Because right? they were cutting the bunches one by one and putting it in the pan. Now, if you're going to make any money at all picking grapes, you use two hands, you put the pen underneath the vine, and you are going as fast as you, as you can. All right? The poor guys had made maybe $5 for six hours of work. All right? And my compadre said, look, guys, I don't mind you working, you know, but you guys are going to starve. All right? So we gave them 10 bucks and told them, this is how you get back to Fresno, uh, in a manner of speaking. Um, and that's what's happening, and those of you who read the newspapers carefully, you know that the Napa Sonoma wine grape growers are getting really concerned about the shortage of labor. Part of it has to do with the craziness that's going on at the border, border enforcement, and so on. Part of it has to do with the craziness of coyotes and the drug trade at the border, and so on. Some of it has to do with the craziness of the concern of, of too many illegals, and so forth and so on. So, but the combination of all those things has led to a situation where we may in fact have a farm labor shortage. And to what extent, if any, we're going to be a, we're going to see changes in that regard remains to be seen. We do have guest worker programs. We still have an H2A program. Did Phil talk about the H2A yes. program? And so on, right? So it's not like having a guest worker program again. Uh, is, is something new and uh, since, since a Bracero program. We've always had those types of programs. But what that augurs for the future in terms of trying to make a living, trying to support a family, trying to support yourself, sending money to Mexico based on farm labor has become a much more problematic question for those people who are still trying to do the work to bring those fruits and vegetables to our tables, into our hamburgers, into our salads, and so forth and so on. I don't think any of us want to go back to canning. None of us are going to start having our vegetables out of cans. That change is long done and over with. So for the purposes of thinking about the welfare of those people who are in fact doing that kind of work is a question that all of us as consumers in one way or another have to think about, way beyond the pesticides and that sort of thing. Right? That's one piece of the pie of this much larger question of how do we deal with the questions of providing the kinds of foods that we want, given our consumption patterns. And we can debate whether those consumption patterns are good or bad, but what does it mean for the welfare of these folks who still have to do farm labor as a means of supporting themselves, their families, uh, and in some cases their loved ones, uh, in this case back uh, in Mexico and the like. Right? And I don't think the UFW at that time really thought carefully about the implications of all the things
that I just raised. Thank you very much. And I suspect, given where we started and where we're nearing uh, the end here and so on, I suspect there are questions that we haven't had a chance to discuss, or some of the statistics, if you want more what, more information, well, what does this mean, and this sort of thing, I'd be happy to, uh, to provide it. I don't know how much of the Bracero story Phil got into. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I do want to refer to my handout, the Bracero program handout, uh, in part because it's a great example of the culpability of U.S. policies and so on in creating this situation in the first place. Right. One is the Texas Proviso, where Texas growers exercise their political influence to basically hire unauthorized workers, even though they weren't supposed to, if you will. And that had a lot to do with the exercise of political influence on the one hand of Texas growers, and on the other hand, the lack of any kind of leverage in Mexico by this time in terms of dealing with that kind of abuse. The other one is drying out, one of my favorites. They would catch these uh, unauthorized, undocumented persons. They take them to the border. Literally, there are pictures where it shows a Mexican fellow putting his foot on the other side of the border. Keep in mind, this is before the Secure Fence Act and so on. Bringing it back, he'd be taken to the ag uh, station and this sort of thing, and he'd be processed as a bracero. He became instantly legalized in that respect, and then he could become a legal bracero and go to work with no problems with the Border Patrol uh, in that regard. Right. And then uh, the last thing I put in there was, in a sense, a modern tragedy, and that is the concept of the hero. And I say a tragedy because the idealism that was invested in this notion of creating communal agricultural plots with uh, people who would be able to use capital, seeds, fertilizers, etc., uh, and, and whatever technology was available to produce much of the agricultural needs of Mexico and so on, never reached fruition. It never was given a chance, in a sense, to succeed. That moment in time where the Hilo was created and greatly expanded, it was over, in a sense, before it got a chance to get off the ground in a manner of speaking. When we went from that period of Cárdenas, 1934 to 40, we went to Alemán uh, six years later, it was over. It was just a gradual battle and struggle on the part of the concept of the Hilo to survive. And Salinas uh, basically put the stake through the heart of that program, but that program was already uh, coming apart, unraveling, and so on, where the Hilo, and in its ideal form, uh, in my opinion, never got a chance, in a sense, to become what many people wanted it to become back in the 30s when the whole concept was, was uh, put together. It's kind of like communal farming, tenant farming, sharecropping. In the ideal form, it was going to work, but in fact it became a horrible system of abuse and exploitation uh, of people, tenant farmers, sharecroppers, uh, and so on. Although, again, in its ideal form, it could have worked, but it didn't. Question. Yeah, and you kind of alluded to it, but nevertheless, the soil without the boomies and the timeline is a, a great event. So they, they don't hire for pickers, they basically have these machines that look like big spiders. Big spiders, yeah. I mean, the first time we, I woke up, I looked at it, I literally looked like it. So the, the time that they do bring people in, and then me, or sit in my backyard with my glass of wine, you know, philosophizing, um, is when they do the pruning, which appears to be a very high skill kind of thing. And then so they do the initial pruning, and then they come and do the tying, and then additional calling. So it appeared to me, just sitting here, that it was more of a highly skilled area. Mm -hmm. So, and I guess kind of put it in the context, today, X farm worker in the grave. I can't speak to the you know, sure, sure. Central Valley. Yeah. I was telling my first you know, my friend here, the first time I went to the Imperial Valley, I thought my air conditioner wasn't working. You know, they're out there, and I rolled the window down, I was like opening it up, and I'm like, yeah, I know that's never happening. But, yeah. um, do you think that the, the, the great, the wine great farm worker is in a better situation than, say, 20, 30 years? He's a better, in a much better situ situation in terms of that period of time that he's doing that skilled work. Right. Much better. Uh, but that phase of wine great production is over in a re relatively short period of time. 
So the question is, what do you do with that work crew the rest of the time? That's why many wine growers have a permanent crew, those five or six guys that's the core of their labor. And those, those five, six guys usually end up being the recruiters. So when they need more workers, the whistle goes out. And if you're lucky, you're going to get people who are, in fact, trained and so forth and so on. A lot of wine growers spend a lot of time, not them necessarily, their foremen, their, their, their farm managers and so on, teaching immigrants how to do that kind of work. And it's great, but again, it only lasts this long. And the same thing with the other phases that I mentioned to you and so on. For the permanent workers, they're premium, right? And these are the guys that sometimes the grower will even provide housing for them and so on, and provide them a level of permanence. Uh, um, I belong to Gunlach Bunshu. Uh, it's uh, one of the first wineries in California. And what I like about that, and Jeff Bunshu, by the way, is a Cal grad, uh, I'm happy to say. <laughs> but what, what Jeff does is he puts aside a certain portion of the profits to put into a scholarship fund for the kids of the farm workers. Okay. Now, if every grower did that, it'd be a much better situation. But it's an example of, it's his way of keeping those skilled workers and so on that allow him to produce the kinds of wines that he wants to do. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't done that for table grapes as much, or raisin grapes, or what is called um, uh, rot gut wine, or jug wine, and this sort of thing. And that happens mainly in the San Joaquin Valley areas like Lodi, Ceres, Modesto, uh, and this sort of thing. Um, but for the premium wine growers and so on, then yes, it's better, particularly for that permanent small crew, not the temporary workers that are utilized for that kind of work. I wanted to ask a couple questions about your statistics. One was sure. the undocumented apprehended, were those people coming mostly through networks with the braceros? Absolutely. The, the better the bracero, the bracero network functions, the greater the degree of migration. And that's why so many came from Jalisco and Michoacan and so on. They were at a strategic point in the elbow, got to the U.S. first, and then it all filtered back. And in that sense, when they came home with the gadgets and the little extra dollars, and so on, new shoes for all of their kids or their mother and so on. It just accelerated that desire to go up. And the history of the Bracero, again, I don't know to what extent Frank or, or Phil got into it. There were riots when, in fact, because of a conflict between the U.S. and Mexican government over who could actually come in. And there was several riots along the border where the workers are behind kind of like a, a fence and the American uh, agents of the INS were on this side, the Mexican representatives of the Department of Labor were on this side, and they were negotiating how many, in fact, were going to go through the gate and actually work. And literally, people said, no way. And they literally charged a fence, trampled it over, and went into the US in that regard. Because very quickly, especially in rural Mexico, given low wages and so forth and so on, that was the way, that was your ticket, in a sense. And uh, the Mexican government made a horrible mistake at the beginning, and that was to have the recruitment, because you had to go through a process of physical, uh, what, um, and physical tests to make sure you didn't have tuberculosis and things of that nature. And they decided to do it in Mexico City, at the biggest stadium at that time in Mexico City. And they had no idea how many people would show up. Hundreds of thousands of people showed up. And they were literally sleeping in the streets. There were no public bathrooms and this sort of thing. There was no foods. And there's this great picture of these ladies. Okay, lots of guys here, no women, they're going to get hungry, right? So they bring out, you know, all these little cooking things. You've all seen it in Mexico City, right? Using charcoal and this sort of thing. And they started making tacos and tortillas and tamales or whatever it was and this sort of thing. Uh, they were totally unprepared, had no idea the reaction would be that large if you will. And of course, for people looking at the US, they say, oh man, this is great cheap labor. We got to get these guys here. So in that sense, the apprehension rate is a reflection of how well those networks were already functioning. But again, at that time, the farm labor cycle was much more predictable without so many of these gaps. So you, once you found out how to get work, you could find work all year round if you wanted to, and especially if you 
were willing to move either within a large area or conceivably working across state borders uh, and the like. Uh, so it attracted those workers who wanted to come, have a predictable uh, uh, source of labor uh, and the like. So the peach, the peach season started in Fresno, went all the way up to Chico, and it could last three months. You could literally live off picking peaches for three months at that time in that respect. All right. And then I was just curious why Starting in 57, the, the numbers of apprehended tail. Look bones. at the numbers of the contracts issued. But it's not nearly as no. different. No. And one of the reasons is the Border Patrol backed off. Oh. Okay. So it doesn't one of the reasons people being can. California growers, Texas growers, Arizona growers said, back off. All right? These people want their tomatoes. People want tomatoes in their hamburgers, fresh ones. Back off. All right? And there was a lot of what, PR, you know, kind of theater, a political theater. Once in a while, you know, they they go out and surround a field. But all of us who were farm workers at that, we knew where all the quote unquote illegals were. Many of them were in our midst, picking tomatoes and the like. But there was a lot of PR, a lot of show mm -hmm. in that regard. And so the border patrol would go out and justify their existence in a sense by picking on one particular field and so on. But in the San Joaquin Valley at that time, easily half already of uh, the people picking up fruit, whatever it was, were people who were undocumented. And they could have, but the, the hysteria was over, the concern about the border, the border being out of control, the possibility of some communist coming in or organizer, all that was essentially over and the border patrol backed off. And they would do the occasional raid out of uh, what, out of a performance. It's kind of like the deportations that occurred recently with the Obama uh, administration. One of the reasons is obviously he's anticipating criticism for not being tough enough on immigration. Right? So he can roll out the numbers. I've deported more people in my administration than the three previous administrations. So don't get on my back about quote unquote illegal immigrants and so forth and so on. So a lot of these ICE raids were for show. They were for political consumption. They made no dent on the number of quote unquote illegals that were working in the labor force and this sort of thing. It did make a dent once the recession happened. The recession is the key source of the reduction of the number of Mexicans coming in uh, without papers. Right. It has little to do with border enforcement per se. All right, per se. Believe me, if agricultural prices went up by 20% tomorrow for the major commodities and so on, we'd have another surge of migration. Right, they get past the drug dealers, past the coyotes, past the border patrol, and so forth and so on. Because right. if you really want to get into this country, you can get in. You can get in. And most immigrants know that, who are in fact determined to get in. Uh, let me get sorry, a okay. question. Yes. Was there another question over here on the side? Another comment? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I just started to read a book. It's called Tomato Land about the tomato pickers in Florida and mm -hmm. the Immokalee workers and stuff like that. Right. And one of the things they talk about in the book a lot is the effect of the pesticides, particularly one used to strengthen the skin of the tomato right. and the effect it's having on the workers. Have they, have they uh, talked about that a lot in the farm workers in California, yes. pesticides and the right. effects? And, so and I, I'm assuming Frank may have mentioned it, that that became one of the organizing tools of the UFW, they tried to raise the issue of pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, and so on, that not only affected farm workers, but more importantly, appealing to consumers yeah. as a means of having leverage with growers uh, and the like. But it never took off as an organizing principle mm -hmm. in the same way that happened in the late 60s and early 1970s. In, in large part, um, one, because Dow Chemical and the other companies and so on push back. And I don't know how many of you have seen all the uh, what uh, advertisements recently, for example, from the oil companies that provide many of the uh, derivatives from petroleum that make pesticides and so on, right? They have to stick to the fruit. And a lot of it is based on petroleum-based uh, chemicals and so on. But we've all seen Chevron with the rabbits running in the green and so on, and what they're doing for the environment and this sort of thing. And most of us don't want to think about it. I want my tomatoes. OK, 
okay, I'm not going to ask for FDA insecticide levels and so forth. It's bad enough most people don't read labels, much less, you know, put a thing into a, a tomato and look at the, the quotient go up of insecticides, herbicides. Most of us don't want to know, right? And most people, and by the way, I, I'm surprised no one's asking about income inequality. There is a correlation between income inequality and the consumables in terms of fruits and, and vegetables. Because the people who have money are the ones that are going to be more insistent on getting the arugula and the spring mix and so forth and so on. The poor you are, right? not because you don't want to, but simply out of economic necessity. You're going to go with the big iceberg lettuce because it's more economical in that regard. All right? So the bifurcation in our income in this country leads to or contributes to the bifurcation on what we consume. And if you're a desperate mom, desperate dad, and you know, making, uh, making it difficult to make ends meet and so on, you're going to buy the cheapest vegetables, quote unquote. Or you're going to use those vegetables that go longer, you know, sort of thing. Yeah, the eggplant looks beautiful. I'd love to have it grilled with a little bit of olive oil and garlic and fresh grated Parmesan and so on, but I can't afford it. Like yesterday, I was looking for spinach. I love sauteed spinach mushrooms, garlic, little white wine, and this sort of thing. It was two dollars a bunch. And I had relatives over. And one bunch, when you reduce it down, you get it, right? You need two bunches at least, and that would be a modest serving, all right? And my brother-in-law, he doesn't believe in modesty when it comes to eating, right? And there was no way I could make saute spinach for all of that large group of folks. So I ended up getting zucchini squash and this sort of thing, and making it with uh, some onion and garlic and, and some cheese on top and this sort of thing. And it goes a lot further for a lot less money. Okay, sort of thing. Also, I don't like my brother-in-law. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we're all teachers here, so we have this unique, wonderful opportunity to share this information. Sure. Humanize uh, you know, laborers for our students. But what do you do when your students say, now, how can I as an individual help? Should I go help the Mokale workers? Or should I contribute to the UFW, or what should I do? What did you tell them? Well, contributing to the UFW is not a bad idea, but I, um, you know, as all of us know, labor has been under tremendous pressure since at least the 1980s. What we call the neoconservative movement, call it what you will, neoliberal movement, and this sort of thing had a tremendous impact. And uh, in that sense, I'm always amazed at my very bright, highly selected, UC Berkeley students, I always ask, what percentage of the workforce are in unions? And I'm amazed at the number of students who think, oh, it must be 50%. Uh, I just had the exercise last week, 80%, right? And then I look at them and they know it's not the right answer. 70% or something like that. And they're just, they can't believe because we hear all these stories about big labor and all the money they're giving to campaigns. And you get this notion that most people are in unions who work and so on. And they're just flabbergasted when they find out it's 13% or so. And you take out public sector employers, employees, right? like teachers and bus drivers and so on, out of the mix. In the private sector, only 6%, more or less, of the labor force are in unions. Right? So to the extent that unions provide a cushion, uh, provide health benefits and, and, uh, and, and other kinds of workplace improve workplace conditions and so on, uh, unions have been under siege, if you will, particularly since the 80s, and it was already going down before that because of the Cold War hysteria and communism and all that. But now, and I don't need to tell you folks, all right, because we can start stories here and we'll be here until 7 o'clock and we'll take out the towels because of all the tears that would, that, you know, but when you give up benefits and, and furlough days and, and contribute more to health plans, all of them. And in that sense, farm labor is not immune from those things. If anything, they're even more vulnerable, if you will. Sure. And uh, to the extent that we have, for all intents and purposes, and maybe uh, what exaggerated, a kind of anti-labor environment, then to that extent, I mean, look at the pension stuff, right? 
And, and they always focus on the guy that's going to make $250,000 a year from you. How many teachers get that? Right? But we're, we're all lumped into the same box in a sense. Well, teacher pensions and all that sort of stuff. And I, no one ever says this percentage of the people receiving pensions are getting this kind of money. Right? They never say that. Or this percentage of the public sector force is getting this kind of money, like fire captains and this sort of thing. But you go beyond that, and it's a different story. All right? So uh, if, if you look at the color-coded thing that I gave out on income inequality and so on, pick your bracket. But most teachers are not in that one that's at the top. Right? We're not in the red line bracket, uh, if you will. All right? Now, if we have a husband or a wife that is making lots of money, that's a different story. We might get into, what is it, the yellow bracket, or whatever it is, uh, sort of thing. But if you're a starting teacher, right, you are cruising down there. It gives whole new meaning to getting down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, what about the, um, the sustainable agriculture and the future of agriculture? We try and suppose they use more uh, labor intensive. Um, yes, so and that's why that income inequality is so important because most sustainable agricultural products to this, to this point Anyway, when you go into a grocery store, organic apples, organic this, or again, they're always a few cents, if not more than a few cents, more expensive. So for those folks who have those kinds of concerns, etc., that's great. But most, but those folks are, relatively speaking, in terms of their proportion of the population, are not enough to sustain the bulk of farm labor. So yes, and as I said earlier, those specialty crops those five, six guys that have that permanent role or sustainable lettuce growers and this sort of thing. But if you look at the proportion of fruits and vegetables that are based on sustainable agricultural practices and so on, it's still a small proportion of the production. Now, luckily, in part because I like wine, right, we're learning to do more biodynamic, as it's called, kind of growing and this sort of thing and try to eliminate the use of herbicides, insecticides, pesticides, and so forth and so on. But it's still a small proportion of wine grape production. And even though we're drinking a lot more wine relative to the past, it's flattened out if you look at the statistics. In fact, there's been a reduction of wine grape acreage because there's too much of it now. And it's affecting the price of quote unquote premium wines. Not to mention the competition coming in from Chile, Australia, Spain, and so forth and so on. So in that sense, for a lot of growers, this is a niche. But a lot of growers can't afford to be biodynamic. Because your production is usually not very large. Uh, it usually lessens your production because of the lack of use of certain kinds of exercise, insecticides, farming, herbicides, uh, and this sort of thing. And it depends a lot on which crop. Which crop? Because sustainable agriculture is more profitable for certain crops as opposed to others. If all of us were munching peaches for lunch, breakfast, whatever it is, then for peaches we'd see an increase in the number of growers that are producing sustainable peaches because they want to appeal to that consumer that's concerned about those sorts of things. But most of us, when we think about a fruit that we want to eat, we don't think about peaches first. <coughs> Maybe apples. Definitely strawberries. You saw the thing about strawberry production and this sort of thing. Maybe bananas, that sort of thing. Banana talk from two years ago, whatever yes. it was. Okay, uh, sort of thing. But uh, it hasn't had the kind of impact, I think, in part because of income inequality. If we could get that yellow bar further up, if you will, then more people would be more concerned about maximizing their consumption of quote unquote quote unquote, good vegetables, good fruit, uh, and the like. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a glass of wine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really a short question because okay. it's a little bit off topic, but I just am curious okay. about it. Um, one of the things which seems to me that changed a lot in, uh, in maybe the Santa Fe Trail for the field, the things, is the introduction of such heavy organized crime on both of the border because of the case, but also moving up in California with the uh, marijuana drug. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how that, if, if that at all, is play with this movement. It 
does, definitely it does, particularly prior to the recession. Uh, because the drug cartels, uh, and I'm being very crude here in the sense that it's complicated, but to try to simplify it a bit, we tried the Colombian approach to the drug cartels in Mexico. And that was to try to decapitate the large cartel organizations. It didn't work. We can talk about why it didn't work. But there, there is no Pablo Escobar, if you will, that dominated the Colombian drug trade. There were other, but definitely Escobar was a big fish, let us say. Uh, when we tried that in, in, um, in Mexico, it was kind of like that Greek mythology, what is it? The, the Misa, whatever, and more heads come up, and so on. But what that has happened, in, in, in my view, is uh, that more and more the drug cartels, and especially their operatives are called, you know, the goons at the bottom, of the, not the guy at the top who has, you know, five houses in different parts of the world and so on. They've gotten into ancillary criminal activities. One is human trafficking, all right? One is sex trafficking, and the other is to prey upon immigrants. Because most immigrants, when they come to the border, on their way to the border, are carrying cash, right? No credit cards and this sort of thing, no debit cards, it's cash and they see them as vulnerable. So, you know, we, we pay attention to that when we have these horrific situations like the 52 people or so that were killed uh, in the state of Tamaulipas, uh, down at the southern end of Texas, if you will. Um, but yes, definitely, it's played a role. It, it makes crossing the border much more dangerous. But it also um, but, uh, exposes, in my opinion, again, the culpability of the United States. I mean, they, the drug trade depends on the U.S. It's the most lucrative, illicit drug market in the world. And we get all exercised, and you hit on a chord with me, right? Because we hear about 38,000 people have killed in Mexico in the last six years fighting the drug wars. Last year, ladies and gentlemen, 38,000 people died in this country from drug overdoses. Now, when have we seen that kind of a headline? We do much, much less in terms of prevention and treatment. And in that sense, the headlines are upside down, in my opinion. But one of the byproducts of that, particularly before the recession, it made crossing the border much more dangerous, much more costly. Much more costly. And it also made uh, the, the entry of immigrants uh, in, into the United States uh, the investment that's necessary meaning that in order to get to the border, that's only one part of the expense. It's finding a job as quickly as possible on the other side of the border. And to compensate for that increase in income means whatever family is, is, is invest, investing in the son or daughter or her husband to cross the border and so on, they have to make more money in order to compensate for the loss of income until he or she is going to be able to send back enough income to compensate for the amount of money now that it takes to cross the border. There was a time where it didn't cost hardly any money. You just waited for nightfall, and you ran across the border, sort of thing. Now, some 5,000, 6,000 Chinese immigrants, there was a great story a couple of years ago, a year ago, $25,000 to cross the border. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of money to save in order to cross it. By the way, most of them come over as indentured. In other words, they already have jobs lined up in San Francisco, Chinatown, Seattle, Chinatown, and so on. Then they pay off that money to the employer by working on it. It's a form of indentured servitude. Very common here in San Francisco in Chinatown and in the new Chinatown in Oakland. Because most of the illegal, about 50% of the legals now are visa overstays. People who come in as tourists, and don't go back. And most of them are Mexican. Most of them are not Mexican. They come from other countries, other ethnicities, other racial groups, and so forth and so on. No, it's just, there's just so much to talk about. Take my 15 week course. Right? It's on CDs, 995. You get it on CNN and the late night shows, uh, and so on. Thank you for being so attentive. By the way, for those of you about taxes and how they're used. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to spend a lot of time at the end. Um, as I said, we'll be sending a survey uh, via email. I hope that you take the time to respond because it's good information for us for the future. Thank you for.
for taking a day to come and sit here and absorb all this information. And 